Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And, and you know, this is kind of, uh, <clears throat> there's, there's something going on here that I want to draw attention to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is that, you know, Paul's kind of laying down the law about this, these individuals that aren't working. You know, he's coming across very stern and, and rightfully so, right? He's saying, look, if there's any, anybody there that's not working, neither should they eat. And he goes even so far to say as in verse 10, for you, even when we commanded, when we were with you, uh, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But brother, uh, but ye brethren, be not weary in well doing. And if any old man obey not our word by this epistle, referring back to what he just said, he's saying, look, if if people aren't going to obey what I just got done saying, and of course the rest of this epistle saying, look, if they're going to hear what I just said about if they're not working, they shouldn't eat. You know, if they're not going to go along with that, if they're not going to get right, he's saying here, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. So this is, you know, you'd say, wow, Paul's drawing a hard line, you know, and he is. But, uh, you know, it was right to do, okay? And so, I, you know, and, I, and I'm all for, you know, drawing that hard line and, you know, telling it like it is. And, you know, we understand what church discipline is. It's something we practice here. But I want to draw attention to verse 15, because I think there's an, you know, sometimes if we're not careful, we can lose sight of <clears throat> the purpose behind, behind all that. You know, the purpose is, of course, to make such an individual feel ashamed, not just so they walk about, you know, feeling ashamed for the rest of their life. The point of that in church discipline is always to admonish that person to, so that they would get right. That's why it says in verse 15, yet count him not as an enemy, you know, but admonish him as a brother. And what I want to, you know, what he's showing us here is that, you know, we should seek to restore backslidden people. You know, people get backslidden, they get into sin. You know, perhaps there's, you know, the specific example of 2 Thessalonians 3 where they're not working and they're to be disciplined by the church. You know, uh, we should seek to restore them. You know, like he's saying there, you know, count them not as an enemy. And say, oh, you know, this person got into sin. And, and look, I've seen it happen time and time and time again where people, you know, we do exercise church discipline. People get into fornication, drunkenness, extortion, covetousness, you know, all these things. You know, some, you know, it's nor mainly it's, you know, you know, when people get into drunkenness and fornication, that's probably the number one thing that I've ever seen people have to get dealt with by the church. But you know what I've also seen is those same people come back. You know, they get right, they get that sin in their life, and they come back. You know, and, w and when that uh, discipline takes place, when people are put out of the local church, as is taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you know, we shouldn't develop this attitude of, well, now they're an enemy. Now, look, if somebody's kicked out because they're, you know, an infiltrator, they're a heretic, you know, they're a Judas, you know, that person is an enemy, you know, and, and well, that's how we'll count them. But we shouldn't just lump everybody together into that group. And, you know, there's some people that we are seeking to admonish them as a brother. And instead of just, you know, marking them off as an enemy and wanting nothing to do with them again, Look, what we, what we should do is admonish them as a brother. Now, I believe part of that admonishment that he's teaching there is the fact that we have no company with them. You know, when people are disciplined by the church, it's not that we're calling up and saying, oh, I feel so sorry, Why don't, you know, hope you can get right, let me know if you need any help. You know, the admonishment that Paul is teaching there is the putting out and having no company with. You know, this person who's had all these Christian friends at church and stuff, when they get disciplined by the church, you know, all of a sudden, all those friends, they're not getting together for coffee anymore. They're not going to go do whatever activity. That is the admonishment that I believe Paul is referring to there. But we don't do that because we're marking them as an enemy. We're doing that so that that person would come to their senses and get right and get back on track with the Lord. And I want to preach to you this morning, uh, the title of the sermon is Don't Beat the Backslidden. Don't Beat the Backslidden. You know, the, the, again, the point of chastening and church discipline is res to, to restore the backslidden, not to rub their nose in it, you know, not to try to make them feel, you know, worse than they should, okay? Now, if you would, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You know, Paul is one, is a great example of this, because Paul is one, you know, who has dealt with people in the churches. You know, he drew a hard line. He was the one that was kind of, you know, laying the groundwork for all this, putting it into practice, but even in Paul, Paul's writings, you know, we see that the, the, the motive behind it, the purpose, was so that people would get right with God, okay? To admonish them as brethren, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, it says, For though I made you sorry with the letter, now he's referring back to 1 Corinthians, where he's talking about how they were to put the, one, you know, put the guy out who was, 
you know, was committing fornication, even so much as not as named among the Gentiles that one should have his own his his father's wife. Now I don't think he wasn't talking about his mother. Probably the situation was, you know, the it was a stepmother, something like that. Who knows what the exact details? But it was fornication is what he was getting at in that first letter, First Corinthians, and he's saying, "I made you sorry with that letter." So look, there's a time when you know the, when 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 to make people feel sorry for their sin. You know that is a biblical thing to do. And Paul says, I do not repent. He's saying, I, I feel sorry, meaning I feel bad that I had to do it, but you know what? That's my job. Part of the preacher's job is to, you know, it's, it's not always fun to call out sin and to talk about the unpleasant subjects that we have to address in this world. But he's saying, look, I felt bad about it, but I do not repent, though I did repent. And it's kind of, you got to kind of think about what Paul's saying here. He's saying, look, I wrote that letter and I felt sorry. I don't repent for writing it, but at the time when I wrote it, I did repent. I felt, oh. I wish I hadn't, didn't have to write that. You know, in his heart, he didn't want to have to do it. You know, we don't want to turn into this, this vigilante mob that just wants to see people get punished by the local church or count every brother that gets out of sorts with the Lord as an enemy. That's not the point. And Paul's showing us that there, here. You know, he is one that exercised church discipline, but he did it out of love and out of compassion for that, those individuals. He said, For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were for but, but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but the sorrow to repentance. You know, Paul's rejoicing over the fact that it worked. You know, they say, hey, have no, have no fellowship with that man. Have no company with him. Put him out, to give him over unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That's what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 5. And of course, if you know the story, that guy got right. You know, he got put out and he got the sin out of his life and he was restored to fellowship. And that's what gave Paul joy in his heart. And look, that is always the motive, and that's what, that is the end goal. You know, whenever a church has to deal with somebody, or we see somebody who's backslidden, and we want to admonish them and help them to get right with God, it's not so we can just make them feel bad about what they are doing, what they aren't doing. It's so that they would sorrow to repentance, and that's a reason to rejoice. Like, there's nothing better than seeing, you know, a, well, I would say there's nothing better, but it's a great thing when somebody who is out of sorts with the Lord gets right. You know, and if you've lived the Christian life for very long at all, you know, we've probably all been there. You know, we're on, we're on our way there. Nobody's perfect. And, you know, we should be careful how we treat others that get in that situation because one day it might be us. Maybe it might not be their sin or to that degree or whatever, but I guarantee you that everybody at some point is going to get out of sorts with the Lord. And look, uh, maybe not to the degree of getting kicked out of the church or whatever, but isn't it a great thing when somebody who is not walking with the Lord begins to walk with the Lord again. It's a great thing. That's a reason to rejoice. The Bible says there's more joy over one sinner that, that, that repenteth than 99 just persons that need no repentance. You know, the angels rejoice over that. <coughs> He's saying, look, I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. You know, and I wish somebody would tell some of these liberal churches this. You know, these people that want to say, oh, you should never feel bad. There's no condemnation which is in, to them which are in Christ Jesus. God's not mad at you. It's your best life now. Look, the Bible says there's a time when we should be, there is such a thing as godly sorrow. You know, we should be sorry for our sin. We should be sorry. We should be ashamed when we're out of sorts with the Lord. You know, whether it, comes, it becomes a church issue or not, just between us and the Lord, it should make us feel that way. That's a natural reaction. Just like any one of us that have children, you know, if our kids got out of sorts with us and misbehaved and started running amok and we had to straighten them out, you know, it would disappoint us if they weren't sorry. If they said, yeah, I'll stop doing it, but you know what? I ain't sorry about it, you know? We, wouldn't, we would feel bad about that. It's the same way with us, you know, when, when we get right out of sorrow, God's pleased with that. God wants us to be sorry after a godly manner when it's appropriate. He says in verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Look, we should not be like the unforgiving world. You know, when somebody sorrows and they repent and, you know, to salvation, you know, and when, of course isn't necessarily referring to, you know, being saved from hell and going to heaven. But it could be because you look again, like I preached Thursday night, the way of the transgressor is hard. He said of the guy in 1 Corinthians to deliver unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You know, the, when a person gets right with God and gets the sin out of their life and starts walking with the Lord, they've saved themselves from a lot of heartache and sorrow. They've saved themselves from chastening of the, from the, the hand of the Lord. 
<clears throat> so look, when, when someone sorrows and, and gets right and they don't have to, you know, that's something they shouldn't repent of. And we should rejoice over that. Whereas the world, you know, they're, the world is very unforgiving, aren't they? The world holds things over people's heads and bring things up. I mean, you think about people who run for, you know, high office. You know, people, they, what do people, what does the opposing side t always often do? They'll dig up some dirt. That if they can find any dirt or anything, you know, they'll bring it up and put it out in the limelight and just say, well, look what, look what they did 20 years ago. Look what they were into or whatever. They'll try to dig up dirt, right? I mean, think about how our, you know, modern justice system works. You know, people get convicted of a crime you know, rightfully so, and they go into, you know, they go to jail, they go to prison, whatever, they serve their time, and you would think that's enough. You know, when years of your life have been sent, spent in a cell, you'd say, oh, okay, I paid my dues to society, but no, what happens after that is that they get out, and then they're on probation for years, and the system just continues to hang it over their head. You know, they can't vote, they can't own a gun, they can't, uh, you know, get certain help. They, you know, they, they're cut off from so many things that other people would get. And they just go through a life struggling. And a lot of them, what do they end up having to do? Turn back to a life of crime. It's like, the, it's a cycle, right? That's, that's, the, that's the sorrow of the world that worketh death. You know, they're not, they're not forgiving people, okay? But look, when we, when we are made sorry as God's children, that's not something to repent of. That's something to embrace. And that's something to rejoice over when people sorrow and get right. And we shouldn't beat the backslidden. People, you know, don't, don't kick a guy when he's down. Don't, uh, you know, I've heard it said years ago is that Baptists are real good about shooting the wounded. You know, and there's, an, there's a grain of truth to that. You know, it seems like sometimes in, in Baptist circles is that, you know, somebody gets out of sore with God and, and people just think, well, it's just a free-for-all. It's just, you know, let's all just pounce on this individual. Now, I don't think that's necessarily the case in our church. You know, I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of that. Praise God for that. But just realize that, you know, the, the backslidden people, they need to get right. And, you know, if we need to have the proper attitude, you know, draw the lines where appropriate, you know, 2 Thessalonians, have no company, admonish them, but know where that line is, you know, and, and, and the whole, understand that the whole point is to get that person right. And look, if we're backslidden, we have to understand something is that as God's children, we are more accountable, not less, right? And just you being here this morning and hearing this sermon you know, this is making you more accountable, you know, to God, okay? Uh, if, you, if you would, go over to, uh, <clears throat> go over to uh, Psalms. I'll have you go there. Yeah, go to, go to Psalms 44. You know, in Luke, he said, For unto whomsoever much is given, Jesus said, of him shall much be required. You know, we should, we should want to stay right with God and get right with God because of the fact that if we have an understanding of what the Bible says, if we've been in church, if we've heard the preaching, we've read, you know, we've, we've been made more accountable. And God's, and, and what, what am I getting at is this, is that no one gets a pass. You know, no one's just going to get a, a pass on, on, on living a life of sin as God's child. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, You have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You know, it's a loving thing to be chastened. It's a loving thing to be scourged. You know, whether it's by the Lord or, you know, through the preaching of God's word or reading his word or maybe a brother or sister in Christ comes to you and, and you know, and just you know, says, hey, you know, you should, I noticed this and you should work on that, you know, or, or, or whatever. You know, that, that's a called admonishment. You know, it's, you know, uh, you know, open rebuke is better than secret love, the Bible says. It's better to, to hear the rebuke of the wise than the song of fools, the Bible says. That's better to have somebody, you know, that's a loving thing when a preacher will get up and preach on sin or preach on false doctrine or admonish the body to get right in some area. You know, it's a loving thing when a brother and sister of Christ comes to us and tries to admonish us to get some sin of our life or develop some godly habit. That's a loving thing that they're doing. Does that mean it's necessarily an easy thing? Let me tell you, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not easy to get up and preach some of the harder truths of God's word, but often that's what people need to hear. You know, and I wouldn't be doing my job as a preacher. I wouldn't be a loving person if I just wanted to get up and just, you know, tell you, you know, and, and never address, you know, people's sins or anything like that. That would not be a loving thing. <clears throat> the Bible, and, and here it's a loving thing when God chastens us, most of all. You know, it's a good thing that God doesn't just give us a pass and let us get away with sin and let us get out of sorts with him. It's a loving thing that God, 
you know, wants to bring us back into the fold and to love us, okay? So that's God's motivation. You know, we see him, you know, he wants to, yes, he chastens and he scourges, but the Bible says that at the, the end of that, you know, it, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness by, them that are ex that, by those that are exercised thereby. When we go through that scourging, when we go through that chastening hand of God, when we're out of sorts with him, you know, the end of that is the peaceable fruit of righteousness if we'll receive the correction. You know, otherwise it's just more chastening, <laughs> which is never fun, right? It's a loving thing that Paul said, you know, admonish them as a brother, you know, uh, it, it, to, to, to bring them in. Let godly, when godly sorrow works in a person's life, that's something to rejoice over, okay? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 19, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, we have, the, we have confidence toward God. Look, there's, you know, here's the thing. The Bible says some men's sins are open beforehand and others they follow after. You know, there's, there's a certain scope that the, the Bible can uh, address when it comes to sin in the church. There's only so many things, you know, my hands are bound as, as the leader here as far, uh, as far as church discipline goes. You know, I just can't throw you out because you wore the wrong color tie or something. You know, I can't just make up these arbitrary rules, these standards. I can't teach for doctrines the commandments of men and start making up. And churches do that. Boy, do they ever. Okay? Um, and I won't go on about that. You know, 1 Corinthians 5 is a very limited scope of the authority that the church has. But do you think that means that if it's not on that list, God just kind of, well, it's not on 1 Corinthians 5, so it's, it's just a field day. It's just open. As long as, you know, or if, I, if it is on that list, as long as nobody else finds out about it, it's, it's not, it's not going to be addressed that God's not going to deal with it. Look, the Bible says here in 1 John that God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Look, maybe it's not in 1 Corinthians 5. Maybe it's not something that the Bible is going to address through church discipline. But if we're out of sorts with God, if we're not right with God, God knows about it. And he'll deal with it. <clears throat> Are you in Psalms chapter 44? Did I have you turn there? Verse 20. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretch out our hands to a strange God, Shall not God search this out? Like, <laughs> what is he saying? Look, if we're not right with God, isn't God going to know it? Of course he is. For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Look, I'm just saying this morning that nobody gets a pass. We're all, you know, going to have to get out. And hope, maybe, maybe not. Maybe some people are going to live their whole life and just always be right with God. You know, highly doubtful. You know, <laughs> Some, somewhere along the lines. Because maybe our actions are right. Maybe the things we say are right. You know, maybe our motives might even be right, but what about the, you know, the way we feel about things and stuff like that? There's all, God searches the inmost parts of our being. You know, and you can't tell me that every single person is just 100% right with God through and through in every core, bit of their being. You know, there might be seasons of that, but we're always constantly having to repent, always constantly having to get things right. You know, and if we have some glaring sin, if we have something in our life that we know is that if our own hearts are condemning us over, Look, God knows about it, and that should be enough to motivate us to get right. So what I'm saying is this. It's not a matter of whether or not we will get chastened. It's really a matter of whether or not we're going to get right. That's the question. Say, well, am I going to get chastened by God? Well, if you ever get sorted out, out of sorts with God, yeah. The question you should be asking is, am I going to get right with God or not? <clears throat> the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, I'll read for you. Go over to Psalms 86. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Look, everyone's going to get chastened because nobody's perfect. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. And he says there that, that, that uh, God deal with, uh, with sons. What son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So again, it's not a question of whether or not we're going to get chastened, have to get things straightened out and, get, and work things out with the Lord. It's whether or not we're going to do that, whether or not we're going to take the time and, and do what we need to do. And, you know, and here's the thing. He's, the question again is, you know, not whether or not we're going to get chastened by God, but whether or not we're going to get right with God. And that is an option. The chastening is not optional. That's coming. You know, if we're out of sorts with God, it's going to happen. When once in some shape or form or another, it's going to happen, you know. 
But does that mean everybody gets right with God? Because that is optional. Not everybody does. And the Bible says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck and uh, shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. <clears throat> so some people, you know, they can get chastened by God and they can even say, yep, this is God chastening me. You know, people can get into some sin that is, 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 is uh, you know, falls under the, 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 the authority of the church and be disciplined by the local church and say, yep, that's what the Bible says. I'm out of sorts with God. I'm not right with God. And just continue down that path. That's an option. The chastening isn't. And people can continue down that path and then one day wake up and their lives are destroyed. Even to the point where God you know, might even kill us and take us home. You say, would God do something like that? Sure. I mean, if we're of no earthly value, if we're just down here running amok and bringing reproach upon the name of Christ, I mean, hey, maybe just say, well, like the old joke says, you know, uh, God brings some children home and crowns them. Others, he crowns them and brings them home. That is a, a biblical concept. But what I'm trying to get across this morning is, is that, you know, we shouldn't beat up the backslidden. When people are out of sorts with God and they know it and they're trying to get right, you know, that's a noble thing. That's a good thing. That's something that we should desire to see. You know, and, and I've seen people, you know, express this openly. And I thought, wow, I mean, you're, you're, you've got a lot of guts putting yourself out there. People say, hey, I'm not right with God. I'm out of sorts with the Lord. And just kind of, not go into detail, but just kind of say, pray for me. I'm backslidden. You know, they, they openly, you know. And, and, and what should be our response? I knew it. <laughs> I knew it all along. Of course you are. You know, was, it's about time you realize that. No, the, the, the response is, hey, I'll pray for you. Or give him a Bible verse or admonish him. Hey, read your Bible more. Come to church. Pray. Hey, or you know, just encourage them to get right. Isn't that what we want for people that are backslidden? Or do you just want to rub their nose in it and say, ha ha, I knew it. No, the, 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 the motive of Paul, the motive of the Lord is that that person would get right, you know, and, and, and spare themselves the chastening. I mean, think about the fact that God wants the unsaved to get right. I mean, God is so compassionate that he even wants, you know, wicked sinners to get saved. You know, such, and such were some of us. You know, how much more so his own child that gets out of sorts? How much more so his own backslidden, erring child? You know, if, he's, if he wants some, some heathen sinner that he doesn't even, that doesn't even know him, to get right, to get saved and come back and come to the Lord. How much more so one that he has bought with his own blood, that he has given his own son for? How much more does he want that person to get right with him who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who has the ability to do works for the Lord, to serve him and to earn rewards in heaven? How much more so that individual? How much more so us when we are backslidden? <coughs> if you're in Psalms, uh, you're in 86, Psalms 86, you know, we should never underestimate the patience of the Lord. You know, the, the, now, obviously there's a line with God. You know, God has, there, you know, you can push the envelope too far with the Lord. God has boundaries, right? But I think sometimes we kind of get this idea that God is just, you know, hovering over us, just waiting for us to step out of line so he can just crush us, right? And I, again, God does chasten us, and he, and he will, you know? But we should never underestimate the mercy and the patience of the Lord. I think sometimes we lose, you know, especially when it comes to other people, when it comes to somebody else that's not right with God. We, we tend to, like, you know, see, see them through our own eye. You know, we, we, we say, well, God's looking at them like I would. No, you don't under, you don't, and we underestimate, am I making sense here? We underestimate how patient and compassionate God is. And he's far more merciful and far more patient than any of us. I mean, consider some of these examples. Think about, you know, Abraham talking down the Lord to ten souls. And so I remember when, when the Lord was going, hey, I'm going to show Abraham what I'm about to do. And he said, I'm going to go destroy Sodom. I'm going to go hear the, see if the cry of it is true. And he remembers Lot. And he, t he talks him down from like 50 all the way to ten souls, right? Now, it turns out there weren't ten there because they got destroyed. But it wasn't that God giving mercy and compassion and patience to a very, 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 and the Bible says they were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And yet God even then was willing to spare if there was just a little bit of righteousness there. That's, you know, uh, to me, that's a picture of God's 
you know, patience and mercy. I mean, look how wicked and sinful our world's become. And I've just, sometimes I just think to myself, how much, how much worse does it have to get before God just, you know, all out just gets the tribulation going? What's it going to take? You know, just tell me and I'll help. I'll push it along. Whatever, you know, without getting to sin, obviously. You know? And here's the thing. God is a very merciful person, very patient, and we should seek to emulate that when it comes to, you know, our brethren, our sisters that get in, that are backslidden, and, you know, especially for our own selves. I think a lot of times people get out of sorts with the Lord, and then they just beat themselves up, and then they just get into this rut, just thinking, well, I'm backslidden, I'm just, you know, there's no coming back, I just, you know, might as well just keep going. You know, you should be more patient and more merciful with yourself and understand that God is patient. Look at Psalms 86, verse 15. But thou, O Lord, are a God full of compassion. He's full of compassion. It sounds like God just has a little bit of compassion over here that only a select few get. You know, if it's just a little bit of sin or it's just, you know, you're just a little out of sorts, you know, you get a little bit of compassion. No, he's full of compassion. There's no, there's no end to it. And gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous, and mercy, and truth. Go to Psalms 112. This is an attribute of God that is brought up over and over again. And we see examples of it in Scripture. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, God wants the whole world get, to get saved. Now, we understand there's some people that can't. You know, that was a sermon a couple weeks ago, or last week. But... You know, at some point or another, God, God's intention for, every, for everybody is that they would repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. That's for everyone. That's a God full of compassion. But sometimes, we're, we, you know, we, we as God's own children could fall into this trap of, well, you know, I'd preach them a gospel, but they're just too wicked. Now, obviously, we understand there's people who are given over to reprobate minds. They're beyond hope of salvation. But a lot of times, sometimes I think, we'd, you know, I, I would admonish that person, but they're just so far gone. You know, we see, or it's some, some fellow Christian we know that's backslidden, and we just say, you know, I, I would reach out to them and try to help them and whatever, but you know what? They're probably just so, it's so wicked that it's not even worth it. Is that God's attitude? Is that how God looks at things? No, God is full of compassion. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. Psalms 112, look at verse 4. Under the upright uh, there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Think about what Jesus said to, uh, when, you know, before, right before he was crucified. You know, when he was coming in on, on uh, in his triumphal entry, you know, riding upon the ass and the colt of an ass. It's, he said in Luke chapter 13, you know, when he looked at the city, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. That's a pretty wicked group of people, isn't it? I mean, when you're killing the prophets, when you're stoning them that are sent unto thee, when you're taking God's, the man of God, the preacher, the prophet, and killing him because you don't like what he's saying, because you don't like the, the message that he's bringing from the Lord, that's a wicked group of people, friend. I mean, and then they, we know what they did to Jesus. And, and, and is that, but was that God's attitude towards them? Was that, hey, you know, uh, the, 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 thou that stonest them that are sent unto thee, you got everything that's coming to you, and I can't wait for it to get here. Is that what he said? He said, how oft I would have gathered thy children together as a hen doth her brood under her wings, and ye would not. I mean, he's lamenting the fact that even as wicked as they were, even as out of sorts with God as they were, that his desire was to bring them back. You know, and it's that, that, and it's a very, you know, that analogy of, you know, a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. That's a very, you know, loving analogy. A picture, illustration rather. Are you in, uh, you're in 1 Timothy 1. The Bible says in one, uh, Psalms 145, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. There it is again. Uh, the Bible's so redundant. Yeah, well, maybe God is being redundant because people need to get this through their heads for their own sake and the sake of others. That God is compassionate, that he is full of, uh, uh, he's gracious, full of compassion, that he is slow to anger and of great mercy. You know, maybe we need to exercise that towards a lost and dying world. We should be that same way. Maybe we need to exercise that toward, you know, our, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, if they're out of sorts with the Lord or not. You know, maybe, or, <coughs> um, I won't say it, I won't go there, but look, the Bible says the Lord is good to all. And maybe we need to exercise this compassion, like I said earlier, to our own selves. 
and stop beating our own selves up and think that God is done with us. God is, you don't underestimate the mercy and compassion of the Lord. It's beyond measure. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Consider the example of Paul the Apostle. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who was, who was an enemy of the church. Paul, you know, when he was Saul. He says in verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the mystery, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. I mean, he was hailing men and women, having them hauled away. And a lot of times they ended up dead. When they stoned Stephen, he consented unto his death. It was his feet that they laid their clothes at so they could go, you know, get busy killing God's, you know, deacon, one of the first deacons. He kills him. Paul was like, hey, good job. He was consenting unto it. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was injurious to the church. You know, and I think sometimes there's probably a lot of people back then that would have just said, well, no hope for Paul. You know, just write Paul off. He says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant. Can you see how exceeding abundant it would have to be for a guy like Paul? I mean, here's Christ who just got done, you know, shedding his blood, dying, living a perfect life, doing all that hard work to save people and build his church. And along comes Paul just running amok, just attacking, killing having people killed, persecuting, you know, locking people up, blaspheming. And yet God, even despite all that, puts him in, he saves him, gets him saved, and puts him into the ministry, makes him a preacher, and goes on to use him to write the vast majority of the New Testament. I mean, Paul is not exaggerating when he says his, that the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I don't think he's being melodramatic. I think a lot of people might be able to make the case, you know, that, that he really was a pretty bad guy before he got saved and got right with God. And I love verse 16. He says, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy. You say, well, why did God do that? Why was God so merciful and long-suffering towards Paul? Why did he still count him faithful and put him in the ministry? Well, he tells us, for this cause I obtained mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He said he did that, that he, did, he saved me, the chiefest of sinners, to be an example to other people that would come after me. To say, to say like, hey, basically the example of, hey, you know what? I don't care how bad you are. I don't care how wicked, I don't care how backslidden you are. God is long suffering and will forgive you and use you. That's, that's part of the reason why he used Paul. To put him out as an example of God's long-suffering and mercy and compassion. <clears throat> so we should never underestimate the mercy and patience of the Lord when it comes to ourselves and other people. You know, we don't want to beat up people who are trying to get right with God and hang things over their head. You know, and, and, I've, and, and like I said, you know, even recently, I, I, I'm kind of preaching to the choir because, you know, in our church here, you know, and, and speaking more broadly in Tempe, like, like I said, I've seen people just come out and say, hey, I'm out of sorts with God. I'm backslidden. Pray for me. And it was so encouraging to see other Christians in the church come to that person and say, I'm praying for you, you know, and understanding that, you know, that repentance is between that person and God, that they need to get right with God. You know, I, and I understand that sometimes, you know, if, if, we, if we've offended our brother, you know, if, if our brother has offended us, you know, we need to go make that right. There's a time and place to take two or three witnesses, so on and so forth. I understand all that. But a lot of times people get out of sorts with God and then like we feel like they owe us an apology. Like, well, you know, I'd forgive them and I'd be merciful and all that, but I don't think they're sorry. Sorry for what? What did they do to you? Nothing. <laughs> you know, their repentance is between them and God. You know, they need to get right with him. Now, again, that's not to say we don't suffer as a church. You know, the Bible talks about how we're all members of one body, right? And we all have different functions. We all have a different place, just like there's a nose for the smelling and eyes for the seeing and so on and so forth, the ear for the hearing. You know, we all have a part to play. So when the body, you know, it'd be like if I just came up and lopped off a, a finger or a toe, you would say, oh, it's just a toe. Yeah, but, you know, the toes are important. <laughs> they play a role. And, you know, if someone lose a couple of toes or whatever, they have to kind of learn how to balance again. 
Now, I remember when I got uh, a, vestibular, a vestibular neuritis. Who's ever heard of that? An infection of the inner ear, the nerve that communicates between the inner ear and uh, your, your brain, the vestibular nerve. I remember a few years ago, I got infected there. Got a, it flared up, and it took me weeks to even figure out what it was. That's a whole story, but, you know, I had to, like, recalibrate, you know, because basically when that happens, you know, the, 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 the nerve doesn't fire at the same rate as the other one. And the vestibular nerve, like, helps you know where your head is in, in space. So it's with your balance, you know, your inner ear, that all plays a part. I'm not trying to give an anatomy lesson up here, but I'm making a point with this. I'm going somewhere, okay? When that nerve got flared up, that one little nerve, that just that little tiny part of my body got out of sorts. Like, I couldn't walk. My eyes couldn't track movement as well. Like, I'd move my head and everything would just go... <laughs> You know, and, and, and it happened right when we were taking uh, church photos two years ago. So if you look at the church photo from two years, like, I'm just like, <laughs> it's, it was, and one kid's crying. I'm just like, take the, this is us, take the picture. One kid's screaming their head off. I'm over there, you know, walking around like a drunk practically. And if people moved and my eyes would try to follow them, I would just be, I'd get like a, a vertigo, right? The point I'm making is that one little nerve, you know, threw everything off. And I had to literally, and they said, well, you know, if you don't get steroids in the first 24 hours, it's, it's permanent. And I was like, well, that's depressing. And I mean, I was out of work for like almost over two weeks. Because I couldn't even stand up and so on and so forth. And I had to like give myself physical therapy. I had to like throw a ball in the air and catch it. They say, well, you can recalibrate your brain to the new impulses. Because like I said, one nerve, you know, they're both firing at the same rate. And then one gets infected and it's slow. I can't do it. But, you know, one's still firing this fast and this one slows down. So now you're getting, your brain's getting these mixed signals about where your head is. And I had to recalibrate. I, you know, again, it did turn into an anatomy lesson. <laughs> but the point is this, folks, is that I had, you know, one little thing go wrong in my body and it threw everything off. You know, and, it's a, and the, the, I believe God, in 1 Corinthians 12, he's, he's likening the church unto a body for a reason. You know, when we get saved and, and we have a, no, a New Testament church to go to, we have a local church to go to and we're part of it, you know, the body grows it can do more, it's stronger. But you start taking away those, you know, take away a member here, or take away a member there. Just cut off a toe here, cut off a toe there, lop off the end of a finger, you know, lose part of a thumb, you know, maybe pull out an eye. I mean, the body's going to suffer. It's going to be disabled, right? And that's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There should be no schism in the body, <coughs> but that one member should have the same care, the, the, but that the members should have the same care one for another. You know, we should care about the other members in our church. We should admonish them. We should help them. We should pray for them. You know, and when they're out of sorts with God, when they're repenting and they're trying to get right, you know, that's the time to, you know, be kind and friendly and open and be encouraged yourself and encourage them. It's not the time to beat them down. Be like. It's about time you got that right. You know, whatever. Get this attitude. And it's out there. It's a self-righteous attitude. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. <clears throat> and you say, well, you don't understand. You know, somebody has a, you know, some brother in Christ, some sister in Christ, they've offended me personally. So I don't have to exercise compassion. I don't have to be full of compassion and mercy and, and, and tender and all that. Was that what Jesus taught, though? I mean, he said, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. <clears throat> and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, uh, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. You know, we should want to forgive people. We should, it should cause us to rejoice when people get right with God, and we should want to forgive people, even if they've personally offended us. You know, and we're like we're, we're legitimately offended. They've legitimately done something wrong against us personally. You know, we should still want to forgive. We should still want to be compassionate and get over that. And one, because we're commanded to. You know, but it should come from a, a place of sincerity, not just, well, Jesus said I have to. You know, we should really want to genuinely forgive people and move on and forget. I mean, I don't know how many times, I know I've let people down in the past, offended people, you know, that, and they've forgiven me. They've extended an olive branch, you know, and, I, and sometimes I wonder, what if they hadn't? You know, or, or what if they just held that over my head? What if they had just reminded me of it constantly? You know, I probably wouldn't, you know, maybe I'd be a different person today. Maybe I wouldn't be here. I don't know. Maybe I would have gotten discouraged. You know, I, are you in Matthew 18? Did I have you go there? 
I'll read to you. Just go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We know this passage. You know, Jesus teaches this like, hey, seven times in a day, if your brother, you know, offending turns, you know, if he's, if he, you know, you got to forgive him. Forgive him. And then, of course, Peter, it says in Matthew 18, came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I forgive my brother if my brother sin against me? Off, but shall my brother sin against me that, and I forgive him? Till seven times? So he wants to find out, like, are you being literal here? Like, so it's just seven times, right? Look, I don't know that anybody that's come to me and, 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 and offended me seven times in a day ever, you know? Um, maybe you can think of somebody. I <laughs> but Peter here, it's just funny. Just, and, you know, I love Peter because he's us. He's, he's just, you know, sometimes he gets a bad rap. Like, I can't believe he said that. Oh, he's, you know, he should just shut his mouth. But, I mean, this is how people are. This is just like the perfect, he's just a great example of human nature. He just kind of lays it all out there. And we can... You know, a lot of us, we don't want to identify with Peter, but we've all, you know, people have this attitude. How often do I have to forgive him? At what point can I stop forgiving my brother? At what point do I get to start, you know, holding it over their head and not forgive? You know, is it seven times? Did you mean, is that what you meant? Seven times in a day, right? I just want to make sure I got the number right. Was it eight or nine, six? I can't, it was seven, right? Jesus saith unto him, I say unto thee seven times, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. You know, I don't have a calculator in form. <laughs> That's a lot, right? Is he putting, is he, and Jesus isn't putting a specific number on it. He's just saying, look, there's, there's no amount of times, Peter. You should forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. We should want to forgive people. And we should understand that, you know, often when it, you know, it's not, when it's not, you know, when it's not a brother that's offended us, you know, they're out of sorts with God, that's between them and God. And they need to get right with him. Are you in uh, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Chronicles chapter 7? He says here, and the Lord appeared unto Solomon by night, so this is after the dedication of the, of the, of the uh, temple. And this is, again, a familiar passage. And said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place for myself for a house of sacrifice, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or I send my pestilence among my people. What's he saying? If I chasten my people. Again, does God chase? Is God long-suffering and merciful and full of compassion? Yeah. But there's also a line with God, and, and he does chasten, doesn't he? He's saying, look, if I, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain. <coughs> California. If I command the locusts to devour the land. And that still goes on today. If I send pestilence among my people, that's it for them. They're done. That's a sign to you that it's time to just rail on them and rip them up, tear them up, and go, you know, up one side and down the other and let them have it and just unload on them and remind them how bad they are. And you see that happen. Is that what he's saying? He's saying, no, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, even when it's gotten to that point where he's punishing the entire land, with these natural disasters. If my people, which are called by name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So he's saying, look, they still can get right with me. In fact, that's why I'm doing that. That's why I'm pushing them. That's why I'm chasing them is so that they will get right. You know, and that a lot of times as a preacher, that's why you have to preach certain things. That's why you have to touch on certain things is that so people will get right. Not because you're just trying to pound your chest or make people feel bad. It's because you want people to get right and live for the Lord, so on and so forth. But notice there's a process there. He says there that they sh if they shall humble themselves, right? You know the re reason a lot of people just get out of sorts with God, they get backslidden, and they never get right? It's because of their pride. You know, some people can't admit when they're wrong. It takes humility to say, I'm wrong. It takes humility to admit, you know, I'm wrong. It takes humility to hear, you know, the preaching of the Word of God and when it hits home, when it steps on our toes to say, well, yeah, but he's right. That's what the Bible says. That takes humility. And look, I've sat in services where it was like the preacher's up there and he's just ripping my face. And, and I know because we talked about it. <laughs> it's like, well, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander. And if one guy is guilty of it, probably there's five or ten other guys that need it too. Or individuals, whatever, and just and just like he's talking about me right now, he's ripping on my face. I can't believe it, and just getting mad and just saying, "Oh, I can't believe this." And you know what made me mad? 
is that he was right. Everything he was saying, was, I was like, it's true, it's true. And it's like he's just taking the word of God and just showing us. You know, just hold, it's, like a, it's like a mirror, like this is you, this is where you're at. And we don't like what we see, right? But we have to understand, but well, what we see is us. And getting out of the service and just no fellowship tonight, honey. It's straight to the car. And we're and just driving home, gripping the wheel. Yeah, but as I drove, it started to loosen up, started to think about things. Get home. A day goes by, maybe two. And I realize he's right. You know what all that was? Pride. That's all pride. You know, people want to get right. If, you know, God's those that were called by his name, if they want to get right with God, it's going to take humility. And a big part of that is admitting you're wrong. The cliche saying, you know, the, a, the AA slogan or whatever it comes from. I think it's AA. You know, uh, what, how does that go? Um, the first step to recovery is admitting you have a problem, right? That's true. How can you get right with God if you're so proud to say, well, I'm right with God. There's nothing wrong here. God's fine with what I'm doing. When he's not, that's pride. He's saying, look, you got to humble yourself and then you got to pray. You know, you got to go to God. You got to talk to him. You got to, you know, it, it, what good, you know, if I offended somebody personally, like another person, and then in my heart, you know, I got humbled and said, you know what, I offended that person. What I did was wrong. And then never said anything to them. That, how is that going to lead to, you know, patching things up with them? How is that going to lead to forgiveness and restoring that fellowship and restoring that relationship? It's not. That person doesn't know that I've, you know, repented in my heart and I feel bad what I did about what I did until I go to them and say, hey, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. And then that person can say, well, I forgive you. So it takes humility. It takes prayer. That's what prayer is. Us talking to God. Us asking God. God, forgive me. Help me get right. Right? And seek my face. You know? Go where God is. It's in the book. Right? He's in the church. Go where he is. Get in the Bible. Get in church and turn from their wicked ways. It's great that you're adding all this, you know, like, well, I'm going to get right with God. I've got the humility. I've confessed it. I've forsaken it. I've gone to God. I've prayed about it. You know, I'm getting, I'm reading. I'm going to church. But you know what? I'm still going to keep doing what, what it was that got me out of sorts with God. No, you also have to turn from your wicked ways. Whatever sin that is, you got to get that out and keep it out. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive for their sin and heal their land. A lot of times people, I think, get this attitude of, well, I'll just sin, and then I'll just confess it, and then I'll do it again later. And then I'll just confess it, and then I'll just do it again. Look, if that's a pattern that you've fallen into, you've, you've never really confessed it. You've never really been sorry about it. <clears throat> There's a process here. And the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Go over to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. <clears throat> you know, we should never underestimate the forgiveness of the compassion of God. We should, we should understand also that, you know, God, uh, the repentance bet is between that person and God. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, we can go to God, we can confess, we can get it right, but often we don't. You say, well, you know, I, I know God will hear and if people humble themselves and repent and do all these things that God will hear. But, you know, but not this person. <laughs> we'll say, well, I know that's true for everybody, but not this person or not that person or whatever. And again, consider the example of, that we see in Scripture of God just forgiving people for things that we would just be aghast about. Consider the example of Peter. I mean, a guy who denied Christ at the most crucial moment. Even after he was warned, hey, you're going to deny, deny me tonight. Three times you'll deny me. It was even foretold. You know, he still did it. And he felt bad. We know he went out and wept bitterly and all that. But what does he say in, in, uh, in Mark chapter 16? I'll read to you in verse 7 when, you know, uh, uh, Mary Magdalene and, and Mary, the other Mary, they went to the sepulcher to, to anoint the body of Jesus. And it's empty and they see the angel there, right? And the angels speak to him and say, uh, Be not afraid to seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples, but don't bother with Peter because he's so backslidden that I don't want anything to do with him anymore. He denied Jesus three times. So, you know what? Just keep it from him. He's out. 
You know, there's no compassion. There's no mercy for him. He's so backslidden. He denied the Lord. We're done with him. Is that what they said? You know, he specifically said, tell his disciples and Peter. You know, because Peter, you know, and, but was that because Peter was still, Peter felt terrible about what he'd done instantly. You know, it says he went out and wept bitterly. And you know, he's probably doubting that he could even be used of God ever again. You know, and again, it goes back to the point I made earlier that we should not underestimate the compassion and mercy of God towards our own selves and think that, you know, we've gotten to some, part in our, some state in our life where just God's done with us. I mean, have you denied Christ verbally to other people yet? Have you done that? that? I know not the man. I know not the man. You know, just denied him three times. Look, even if you had gone that far, God wasn't done with Peter. He said, hey, go tell Peter the Lord is risen and that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall, shall ye see him as he said unto you. Of course, we know Peter goes there and the story goes on, but you know, we still find Peter backslidden again in John chapter 21. It says in verse 15, remember when he comes to him and they, they, he finds his disciples out fishing on the boat, Peter says, I go a fishing and all the disciples go with him. That's not what he was supposed to do. I don't have time to really go into that. And then God catches him again, you know, red-handed, like, hey, I told you to tarry in Jerusalem. What are you doing here? You're supposed to stay put until the day of Antioch, or the day of Pentecost came. And here you are fishing. You're going back to the old life. Even after all that, Peter's still beating himself up and just saying, well, there's nothing better for me to do than just go back and fish. And of course, Jesus calls to them. They say, it's the Lord. They jump in the water. They row back and they sit down and they have a nice fish dinner. And then it says in verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, uh, Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And I don't believe he was referring to the fish. Some people debate, well, what are the these there? Well, he's talking about, do you love me more than fishing? You know, I don't think it was that shallow. That's kind of a dumb question. You know, if, you, if you're loving fishing more than Jesus, then, you know, you got real problems. But it was, goes back, he's referring back to the fact that, Jesus, that Peter had said, yea, though all men forsake thee, yet not, uh, that I will not deny thee. He said, I am, ready to, I am ready to die with thee. That same night that he denied him. What was he saying in his pride? I love you more than anybody. Though all these other guys forsake you and leave, not me, I'm going to stick around. So Jesus, again, kind of bringing it back up, kind of calling him on the carpet a little bit, kind of reminding him of what he said, and patching things up and clearing things up with him. He's saying, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He's saying, You love thee more than these, these other disciples that are here with me? He said, Look, it doesn't matter. You know that I love you, and that's all that matters. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He's like, Look, let me give you a job to do. You know, Peter, Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter, he's gotten right here. He's got the right attitude. He wasn't like, yeah, of course I love you more than these other guys. You know, he couldn't really say that after you denied the Lord three times. And God, and Jesus wasn't like, well, I'm glad to hear you say that. You know, you can go now. <laughs> he said, feed my lambs. What is he talking about? He's about, go preach the word. You know, go, go be a pastor. Go be a preacher. Go serve me. He saith in him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Of course, he does this three times because that's how many times Peter denied the Lord. He saith unto him, He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And I just love the fact, you know, that the Lord is dealing directly with Peter about his situation. He wasn't like, hey, John, do you think Peter loves me more than the rest? <laughs> he wasn't getting somebody else involved. And you have to understand, a lot of times when people are backslidden, when people need to get right with God, it's between them and God. And it's not, we don't need to sit there and beat people up and beat them over the head. We should encourage them. We should and be rejoice that they're even to that place in their life. <clears throat> you know, God wasn't finished with Peter and he gave him great responsibility. So the point I'm trying to make this morning really is this, you know, if we are backslidden or if someday we find ourselves backslidden, you know, I'm not saying you should excuse that, but if you want to get right, you know, if you want to get right with the Lord and, and, and get back in, 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 into things, I'm just saying this, go easy on yourself. I'm not saying don't feel bad. I'm not saying, you know, th th Paul wrote his letter and he said, I'm glad you sorrowed though it were for a season. But don't turn it into this just the rest of my life. I just have to, you know, flog myself and crawl through glass or whatever it is. You know, people develop these. They just, they just beat themselves up. 
Go easy on yourself. And you know what? Maybe if we see somebody else in that situation, go easy on them. Go easy on others. You know, when I was writing this, I, I, I thought back, you know, my own life, like I said earlier, of, of people that were patient and, and kind and compassionate and merciful towards me when I was not being, the, you know, an ideal Christian. You know, I got, first got saved, and I had to work some things out in my life. And, uh, you know, I remember there was this Christian family that had taken me in. I was friends with their son. And, I mean, I was still pulling things, but, you know, doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing. And you know what they were? Compassionate. They're like, you know what? We're not going to kick you out of the house, out of our home, in the middle of a Michigan winter. <laughs> We're going to let you go. And can you say, but you know what? You need to stop doing this. You need to start doing this. You need to go to church. You need to, you know, so on and so on. And they tried to encourage me in the Lord. And you know what happened? It, is it worked. You know, I, I never forgot that. I always remember how compassionate these people, how patient they were with me. So that's what I'm trying to get across this morning is that, you know, we shouldn't beat up people who are backslidden, especially when they're trying to get right with God. You know, let's come, come, come alongside and help them, encourage them to do the right thing. <clears throat> Don't shoot the wounded, you know. And we could talk about, and i got to wrap this up, you know, we could talk about the example of Mark. You know, remember Mark in, in Acts where, where uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas were going to go on another missionary journey. And Barnabas thought it good to take, Paul, to take Mark with them. But Paul said no, because he went not with us to the work. You know, in a later, in another journey, you know, the previous mission they went on. At some point, Mark was just like, ah, I'm done. You know, kind of fell out, kind of quit halfway through or whatever. And because of that, Paul's like, well, I'm not taking that guy. He's a bum. You know, he's not, he doesn't go to the work. And the Bible says the contention was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas that they went their own ways. But what was, what it, was that it for Mark? Was Mark just done at that point? No, because remember in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is writing saying, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitably for the ministry. And what I'm trying to get us to understand is this, is that when, when somebody's backslidden, that doesn't mean it's over for them. You know, if we're backslidden, it's not over for us. God is compassionate, he's full of mercy, and that we can still be used by God, like Mark, who wasn't right with God. You know, whether or not Paul's testimony is true or not, I, I believe it is, you know, that's kind of a matter of opinion, but it was, Paul, Mark did something. I mean, if he was really profitable early on, of course Paul would have been like, hey, yeah, let's, let's grab Mark and go. You know, but even after that, years later, Mark got right. You know, he, he got in service with the Lord to the point where now Paul's asking for him. Hey, bring him here. He's profitable for the ministry. <clears throat> so let's not shoot the wounded. If you would, go over to Galatians chapter 6. We'll close here, Galatians chapter 6. You know, we don't want to be the reason why someone doesn't get right with God. You know, oh, I, you know I'd get back in church. I'd get that sin out of my life. You know, I'd start serving to God again, but, you know, when I got out of sort, you know, everyone treated me like a jerk. Or I know if I, you know, I know if I show my face or come around or whatever, people are just gonna, you know, pick on me or whatever. You know, we don't want to be the reason why somebody else doesn't get right with God. Now, should they get right with God anyway? Yeah, but that's not human nature. You shouldn't shoot the wounded. Look at Galatians chapter six, verse one. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, right? So. This is, a, this is an attitude, a mentality, an approach that spiritual people have. So if we are lacking this, you know, we're the ones that aren't spiritual. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know, there, there's a good reason to have the right attitude towards people that are getting right with God or are out of sorts with the Lord. Because it might be us that's tempted next. And we would probably hope that people around us would be spiritual enough to be meek and gentle and kind and compassionate towards us. He says in verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. <clears throat> so just remember that, you know, if we see a brother or sister in Christ who's backslidden, that they have to get right with God, not you. Right? It's between them and the Lord. They have to get right with the Lord. They, they, it's not them getting right with us. You know, of course, unless they've offended us, you know, then that's another sermon. We talked about that a little bit. But they have to get right with God, not us. And the whole point is, let's not be a hindrance to them 
doing so. Let's go ahead and pray.